Didache, Greek for teachings, is the short title of the work called The Teachings of the Twelve Apostles. It's an early Christian work that was cited by church fathers but was lost. It was rediscovered by Philotheos Bryanios, a Greek Orthodox bishop working in Constantinople. In 1873 he discovered what is now called the Codex Tyrolus Elimitanus, which means Jerusalem Codex, in the library of the Jerusalem Monastery of the Most Holy Sepulchre. Jerusalem was part of the name of the order. The monastery was in the Greek quarter of Constantinople. The Codex dates from the 11th century and includes several ancient Christian texts, among which are the Epistle of Barnabas, the first and second epistles of Clement to the Corinthians, several pseudo-epigraphic epistles, a synopsis of the Old and New Testaments by St John Chrysostom, a 4th century Archbishop of Constantinople, and the Didache. The Didache was written in Greek and is quite short at about 2,600 words. It seems to be the product of an early Christian community, the same community primarily used or possibly wrote the Gospel of Matthew. There are 16 chapters, the longest of which is about 300 words. It is widely regarded now as a composite work with contributions from multiple authors at different times. The first six chapters concerned the two ways, an ancient Jewish idea of one way of virtue and life and the other of sin and death. Then there are chapters on cautioning against false teachers and food offered to idols, on baptism, the Eucharist, support for prophets and teachers, appointment of deacons and bishops, and finally a short apocalyptic chapter. It contains no historical events or persons to assist with dating. It must be no later than the 4th century because it was cited by church fathers then and a fragment of 4th century Greek papyrus of it has been found. Also, it contains material in common with Matthew and Luke, which has led scholars to date it after their writing. Within this wide range, the principal means of dating is fitting its comments like those on bishops and deacons into our understanding of church history. However, there are two problems with this dating scheme. The Didache is a composite text. That is, it is not the work of one author at one time, but rather shows evidence of evolution from an initial version of an ideological and rather stoic nature that was later adapted by the changing needs of the community, specifically the need for money, and cross-referencing to Matthew as that text either became available or prominent. Therefore, successfully dating one section does not allow us to confidently date the rest. The other problem with this dating is the same as with the letters of Paul. Conventional first century church history is heavily dependent on Acts and the church fathers, and if you reject that narrative, it pretty much pulls the dating rug from under the Didache. The majority view is that it dates from the last half of the first century, but there is one scholar in particular, Reverend Alan Garrow, who considers that the earliest layer of the Didache may have originated as the decree of the Jerusalem Council of 48 AD, referred to in Acts 15 and Galatians 2. That would date it before Paul's letters. And at least by secular reckoning, that would make it the earliest Christian work that we have, although conservative Christian scholars would date Mark's gospel a few years earlier than that. Garrow argues that the Didache is at least part of the Q source and was used by Matthew and Luke. He's made a series of videos on this, which I link below. Garrow's view is a minority one, but it does have the advantage that it is not dependent on the conventional narrative of first century church history. And there are other indications of an early date for the Didache. Its discussion of the two ways and what it has to say about sacrifice and the Eucharist suggests that it represents a transitional phase between Judaism and the earliest form of recognisable Christianity. The Didache has material in common with the Gospels of Luke, and particularly of Matthew, leading to the three familiar possibilities. The Didache used the Gospels, the Evangelist used the Didache, or both used a common source. If two texts are different but have enough common words and phrases to make it clear that they are interdependent, we can often tell which came first by examining the differences between them. One way of doing this is looking for changes that improve the flow or rhetorical impact of the text. If we find that, it means a purpose can be seen for the changes in one direction, but not in the other, and that means the better text is the later one. Another method concerns mixing and selection. 
we may find ideas that appear together in one text scattered in the other. And this can happen because an author is retaining the order of ideas but elaborating on them, or because he's borrowing from the original text to fit ideas into his text where they are most appropriate to the flow of his argument. In both of these cases, the text with the scattered ideas is the later one, and the earlier one has them together. However, there is one other possibility, and that is that the author is selecting ideas to bring together because they have a common theme. So this time, the original will have the scattered ideas, and the later version will have them brought together. But, as with the rhetorical improvement method, this also requires that we can perceive a purpose in bringing these ideas together. So when comparing two texts, one of which has ideas together and the other scattered, the scattered one is the later, unless we can perceive a purpose in bringing the ideas together. Starting with Matthew, we can use a somewhat involved application of the mixing selection argument. This is Alan Barr's diagram of synoptic relationships, and you can see the way almost all of Mark has been used by Matthew, and how Matthew has scattered it throughout his Gospel. The curious thing about the Didache is it contains 20 or so passages in common with Matthew, but not with Mark, which means that if the Didachist was using Matthew, for some reason he managed to avoid all the red parts here, and we cannot discern any purpose for that, meaning instead that Matthew was using the Didache. Turning now to the test of rhetorical improvement, Garrow uses the common material between the Didache chapter 1 and Luke chapter 6. So first the Didache chapter 1. There are two ways, one of life, one of death, each having great differences between them. The way of life is this. First, you must love the one who formed you. Second, you must love your neighbour in the same manner as yourself. Do not do to others what you yourself would not want done to you. And these are our teachings. Bless the ones who curse you. Pray for your enemies. Fast for your persecutors. Do not expect a great reward if you only love those who love you. Do the Gentiles not conduct themselves accordingly? But if you practice love to those who hate you, your enemies will vanish. Refrain from the impulses of your selfish nature and the self-serving world. If someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn the left to be likewise struck. This discipline will lead to your perfecting. If someone forces you to go one mile in service, go with him a second. If someone robs you of your robe, freely give him your coat. If someone takes anything from you, don't ask that it be returned, for what good would that do? Give to all who ask and don't expect return, for your parent in heaven wills that everyone should be recipients of our free gifts. Great rewards await anyone who gives according to the commandment, for that person is guiltless. A negative return is given to the one who receives but has no need, for he will pay the penalty for why he has received for nothing but greed and under examination will be required to divulge everything concerning his choices and will not be free from his obligations until everything owed is paid. On the other hand, the one who is in need and receives is guiltless. Let your gifts rest in your sweaty hands until you know who can discern to whom you should give. This looks as though a high-minded commandment had to be qualified in the light of its abuse, one of the reasons for believing that the Didache is a composite work. Anyway, Luke's version is chapter 6. But I say to you who are listening, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. To the person who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other as well. And from the person who takes away your coat, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks you and do not ask for your possessions back from the person who takes them away. Treat others in the same way that you would want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you have hope to be repaid, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, so that they may be repaid in full. But love your enemies and do good, and lend expecting nothing back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to ungrateful and evil people. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. I think it's pretty obvious which is the best version. Luke has done such a good job that he's created one of the best crafted and best loved passages in all of Western literature. Look at the changes he's made. He's reordered the Didache into a more logical sequence with instructions first and then reasons for those instructions. 
He's changed the negative golden rule into the positive golden rule, making do not do to others what you yourself would not want done to you into treat others in the same way that you would want them to treat you. He's cut out lines that don't add much, such as refrain from the impulses of your sinful nature and self-serving world. This discipline will lead to your perfecting. And he's added a new phrase that's a zinger that has echoed down the millennia. Love your enemies. If you were the writer who started with the Didache and ended up with Luke, you would be well satisfied with your work, but the reverse is just not true. Ergo, Luke used the Didache, not the other way around. Turning back to Matthew, the passages common to Matthew and the Didache represent all of the different chronological layers of the Didache with the exception of mentions of the Gospel, presumably Matthew's, and the Trinity, suggesting that Matthew had virtually the whole Didache as we now know it, rather than a significantly earlier version. So it seems that Luke and Matthew both used the Didache, and it was virtually in the form that we now have it when it was used by at least Matthew. Garrow goes on to make arguments that the Didache, at least an early version of it, predates both Thessalonians and Galatians, and therefore predates Paul, as 1 Thessalonians was his first epistle. These arguments are weaker, but still of interest. They're based on the possibility that the Didache was responsible for provoking the disquiet which occasioned these two letters. The Thessalonians had a problem in that something in their word of God had caused them to grieve over the lost souls of believers who had died. And Paul's job in this letter is to reinterpret their word of God so as to avoid this conclusion. The Didache chapter 16 could be the culprit. Guard your lives, keep your lamps burning and ever prepared for the hour is not known. Gather together frequently, pursuing that which will benefit your souls, otherwise the entire time of your faith will be nearly worthless, if you have not persevered to the end. Then there's a few lines that are less relevant, but going on. And third, the resurrection of the dead, yet not of all, but it is said, the judge will come and all his angels. Then the world will see the judgment coming on the clouds of heaven. So this could look as though anybody who hasn't persevered until the end isn't going to get resurrected. Could this be the cause of the Thessalonians grieving about their departed members? Quite possibly. Paul's gospel to the Galatians was that salvation came through faith in Jesus, and observance of the Jewish law, including circumcision, was not necessary for salvation, and not sufficient for salvation without faith in Jesus. After his departure from Galatia, Judaizing preachers appear to have visited and persuaded the faithful that observance of the Jewish law, including circumcision, was required for salvation. That occasioned Paul's angry letter. Garrow argues that the Didache may have had some connection with the decree of the Council in Jerusalem, mentioned in Acts. Paul mentions the Council, but not the decree. If so, then the Didache could possibly explain why the dispute had arisen, because its wording on obedience to the law is open to different interpretations. In chapter 6 it says, Be on your guard, for many would like to lead you away from the way of the teaching, for their priorities have no regard. If you are able to bear the yoke, you will be perfect, but if you can't, you should make your best effort. And concerning food, eat what is right, but guard that you never eat that which has been sacrificed to idols, for that is recognised as worship of the dead. After that, chapter 7 and on describe baptism and the Eucharist. This seems to be implying that a bit of flexibility is permitted to allow somebody to be baptised and partake of the Eucharist. But then, as we've seen in chapter 16, it's got this line. Gather together frequently, pursuing that which will benefit your souls, otherwise the entire time of your faith will be nearly worthless, if you have not persevered to the end. All of which seems to imply that while observance of the Jewish law is not required for baptism and Eucharist, it is going to be required for salvation. That could explain the disagreement evident in Galatians, and again would put the Didache before Paul. These positions on Galatians and Thessalonians are pretty speculative. We have no direct evidence that this is what happened, even though there is reason to believe that the Didache may have been in existence at that time. So they're not strong arguments, they are however intriguing. Stronger is the argument that the Didache predated Matthew and Luke. The Didache is a composite work that evolved over time, and the version used by Matthew was a fairly late one. Therefore, the earliest layer of the Didache predated these Gospels by some time, which is consistent with a pre-Paul date. 
There is a further argument for an early date for the Didache connected with the account it gives of the Eucharist. This appears to be a pre-Pauline version of the Eucharist, but I can't really use that argument here. I'm going to go on to argue that establishing an early date for the Eucharist tells us something about the development of Christianity. It would be circular to use something to establish an early date and then use that early date to draw an implication from the same thing. Pre-Gospel dating is more significant than redating the Didache by a decade or two at the end of the first century, because if the Didache used the Gospels, then it has an earliest date of writing around the end of the first century. Whereas, if the Gospels use the Didache, then that becomes a latest date of writing, and that change from earliest limit to latest limit has much greater significance than one or two decades. It could date back to an escape from Damascus by Paul under King Aretas in the 60s or 70s BC, as implied in 2 Corinthians. And it makes the Didache contemporary with the period during which mythicists hold that Christianity was a mythicist religion. I will turn to that in the next video.